Good afternoon. Excellent. Three, two, one, and we're now live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Spook Fest. Um, this afternoon, I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew James. Is it Greg? Am I saying it is Greg or it is, is Greg? That's correct. No, it's, it's Greg. Greg and 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 Greg Moss. So we've got it's two like Gregs. the two names are linked, two Karen. That's what it is. <laughs> they are. It is. Um, and this afternoon, we're going to be talking about um, storms and catastrophes. Um, and just before we came on, Andrew and I were talking about the potential storm that's going to be hitting the um, south of England on um, Wednesday, which is called Storm Kieran. So uh, that's another one to be looking forward to. Um, um, so tell me, Karen, am I able to reply in the chat? I don't know, actually, but um, I will read them out. I don't know whether you can. Can you see them? I, I, can yeah, see I, can see, I can see Effie and Sarah have both said hello. And hello, I was Effie gonna... and Sarah. <laughs> exactly, Andrew. I was going to say hello. <laughs> Beat you to it. So, and yeah, Sam yeah, is there yeah as well. I don't know. I mean, yeah. That's all right. I, if not, I can we'll speak just speak it we'll out just... loud. There you go. Consider it. Yeah, spoken. speak it out loud. That's fine. <laughs> So, thank you for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, would you like to introduce your books? We're talking about uh, the new genre that I had not heard, whether we ha want to call it um, cli-fi or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, apparently, it is a new subgenre of climate fiction, climate climate sort of science fiction, if you like. Do, do you um, know how so I, I discovered it? It was the lady from Waitrose magazine that rang me up to do an interview and said, do I mind if she calls it Cli-Fi? And I oh, said, really? if, she puts, if she puts it in Waitrose magazine, I said, you'd call it what you like. Oh, I used to <laughs> dream of getting in Waitrose magazine. Exactly. God. Damn. <laughs> yeah, just, just call it whatever you want if it wants to go yeah. in your magazine. There well, it's know. like the Australian noir, which is, you know, there's there are these little sub-genres popping up yeah um, there really are i so i don't i mean this this part of this sort of professional publishing thing i think is all really interesting i was talking to my editor of my other series uh hodder and stoughton which is a cozy crime series and i was talking about the things that she's particularly interested in and um maybe we'll come back to that later on this sort yeah. of sense of what are these sort of hot niches currently in publishing which i thought was quite interesting yeah, hmm. we will. Well, talking of hot niches, uh, I know I had this conversation with someone about uh, about cli-fi and what it meant, and they thought it was a particularly hot niche in uh, sort of sex fiction because uh, <laughs> they completely misunderstood what the cli actually stood for. Uh. So, um, so it's nothing to do with a wee man in a boat, but uh, yeah, climate fiction is the goodness uh, me. Is the so right, anyway, difference. I understand. Bringing it back to. To Sorry, the today Karen. and our storms and catastrophes. Um, would you like to both introduce your books and yourself? Oh, yes, that's what you said just now, isn't it? Andrew, introduce <laughs> your books. <laughs> I shall introduce mine. It's very good of you. Uh, this one is A Song of Winter, uh, which is my Cli Fi book. And basically, it, uh, it considers what would happen if we, uh, if the planet tilted into another ice age. Um, and as the climate is becoming more and more unstable, um, who knows what might happen? But yeah, that's basically what it's about. Uh, Scottish family uh, trying to survive against the odds and a mum who's particularly efficient with a crossbow. Oh, I love nice. that crossbow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Shall I go? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, um, during uh, during lockdown, I wrote a, a, a cli-fi future dystopian novel set in 2037 called The Coming Darkness, which you might be able to see on the wall behind me, um, the, the cover, because I've not got it to hold up in my hand. Um, that comes out in paperback, um, at, you know, supermarket and so on for in November, so next month. And will be followed, followed next April by The Coming Storm, which is a sequel with the same principal characters. And will soon be followed by the one that I've almost finished writing. I'm gesturing over here to the chair I sit in when I write, <laughs> uh, called The Coming Fire. And that's the conclusion of the trilogy. At the center of these books is a French uh, Secret Services agent called Alexandre Lamarque, who is a very perceptive and intuitive person who can see patterns that are invisible to others and bear in mind that we're in a future in 2037 where algorithmic intelligence has become even more important than it is today 
And it's, in a sense, these adventure novels are also about the fact that human intuition will remain valuable in an age of artificial intelligence, as well as, you know, the climate disasters and all the other things. <laughs> wow, mm -hmm. amazing. How did you... Um, Good stuff. How, how did you both sort of get into the, you know, what made you decide to, to go into this genre? Was it just, was it a conscious decision or was it something that just sort of happened? Uh, well, if I can leap in, uh, I wrote a climate fiction uh, purely because I was getting so hacked off with uh, what was happening to the world, really. Um, so I wrote it from a position of, uh, of anger, uh, especially when faced with all these climate deniers out there. Uh, and I basically pretty much um, killed off the entire planet. Uh, and I felt a lot better afterwards. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's that's basically what I did. I also didn't want to get typecast into being a, a crime fiction writer, um, although the very first book I wrote is more of a, a tartan fairy noir, which I self-published, and uh, all the agents out there and publishers threw their hands up in despair and said, I, I don't know where we put it on the shelves. So um, uh, that's still out there waiting, really. Um, but the very, very first book I ever wrote uh, was 2018, which is a factual book uh, and is a guide to uh, Scottish Cayley dancing uh, with Lewis Press. So uh, there you go. A very, uh, very bag. Yeah, but when you, good. sorry, Karen, I just wanted to say to Andrew, when you said, did you find that the anger was a good fuel for writing then? Oh, I think so. I, th I think you have to have emotion in your writing. Otherwise, uh, it all becomes a bit pedestrian, doesn't it? So, um, yeah, yeah, it was a good, um, there's always something sparks off. A book isn't there uh the first crime book i wrote um was purely because uh i'd been to a a, a festival and someone in the audience um this is before i was a, a writer really uh said you know what what what's, what are publishers all looking for and they, and she said um, oh crime uh, particularly tartan noir uh, if you write one of those uh, people will be biting your arm off uh, so i wrote whirly gig which uh, which did exceptionally well uh, except now, I, of course, uh, I expect all my books to do just as well. And they don't, unfortunately, so they don't all get shortlisted and all the rest of it. Oh, the world is so cruel, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's cruel, I tell you. But you, you have to batter on, don't you? You have to batter so on. The, um, the, um, so my answer, briefly, to this is that I was in um, February 2020. I was in Dubai at a festival with um, an, an old friend of mine, Luigi Bonomi, who's an agent who I did a couple of panels with, one of which was a workshop. And after it, Luigi said, Greg, why don't you write a co crime novel because I think you might be good at that and I said all right I'll do that and so five or six weeks later I sent him 20,000 words and said is this what you mean and he said yes that's more or less what I mean then there was lockdown and I had to drive around the country and gather our children back into our house and look after them and you know you remember detoling the the shopping and all of that yeah. <laughs> um, um I got distracted from cozy crime I think reasonably enough by um the uh, coronavirus emergency alongside all the other climate driven emergencies of population movements and wars over water and crops and so on. And I wrote The Coming Darkness instead. Um, but um, it, it was um, it was because of the isolation of lockdown. So that was a little bit like you're talking about, Andrew, um, the anger that drove in part your writing for me it was that isolation that gave me this very tight focus that every morning at 6 30 i was in that chair behind me writing this book and of course um, just to complete this sequence of events um it was almost too motivating that solitude uh, because working in theatre, as I've done for a lot of my life, with people all the time, that I channeled all of their energy into this solitary writing and ended up with 170,000 words, of which the publisher only really required 98,000. So <laughs> wow, that's a chop. <laughs> do they pay you double? They do not pay double, but <laughs> it did mean that it was super easy for me to write the follow-up, The Coming Storm, because there were two major plots that I took oh. out of The Coming Darkness. And, and, and because it's quite a tight timeline, I only had to postpone them by a couple of months mm. in 2037 to make them run. So that was yeah. that was me. Okay. Yes, it was a very strange psychological time for everyone involved, wasn't it, really? Mm. The uh... 
the pandemic. Uh, so yeah, and then of course, r- of course, writing the cozy crime afterwards was a complete antidote, Karen, because mm. it was it's uh, uh, we were at. Um, my wife, Kate Moss, and I were at Fatal Shore Festival a couple of weeks ago, and, our, and Vasim Khan said, the reason we write cozy crime is because we want to make people good, feel good when they get to the end, that everything's fixed, right? That's what yeah. cozy... So that was the antidote to this um, dystopian adventure writing of The Coming Darkness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's... Because um, one of the things that I think about crime is that it's also escapist. People quite read crime because they want to escape reality because not everybody is going to go out and murder somebody. Um, you know, some people are and some, but most of us read crime because it's it's so far away from what we imagine and what we do in our daily life. So actually, when you do this, when you go to a thriller, like yours are thrillers about, you know, particular things, it's, it's very different. It's it's going into another, it's still escapism, but you're going into a world that you don't necessarily want to be in. Um, so do you, when you start to plan your books, did you always As if, sort of, as if, yeah. plan my books. <laughs> no, are you not a planner? <laughs> are you a planner, Andrew? Uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm the most uh, unlikely <laughs> antithesis to a planner you're ever likely to find. <laughs> no, uh, spreadsheets Who and answers? I never, never meet. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah I don't want to mis- misdirect you but I I know what's going to happen but I don't plan it. Do you see mm. what I mean? I have a sense, you know, my story is going to go there's going to be a setup and that'll be the first 20 25,000 words. And then there's going to be the sort of what Louise Doughty once called to me the the long middle which is like 40,000 words or something. And then there's the crescendo and climax in which all the questions are answered. So I know it's going to have that shape because that's <laughs> what, what that's are, the though. shape of a good book, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I have actually literally started with a blank page and absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Uh, literally no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and I just let the story take shape. So somewhere in my subconscious, something is churning away and, and doing the planning for me. Um, and it's only about halfway through a book that I actually have any conception as to where all these strands are possibly going. I'm not alone in that. Um, there are some other authors out there who do the same. And um, I, I know that the, the, the general sort of uh, feeling about it for, from our viewpoint, uh, the, the mad pantsers, is that it keeps the interest going because, you know, the person who most wants to know what happens next is the writer. Um, but this latest um, set of books I'm writing now, I've um, got a three book deal with Storm Publishing. Um, they have asked for a synopsis. Uh, of the next two books Bastards. For, the, God for the first time in my life i have actually had to write a synopsis for two books that i haven't even thought about so uh, yeah i guess i'm i'm being forced into being a planner so I, i've got a, 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 a comment on that so i wanted um i'm very so because the the follow-up the coming storm has not yet come out although we've got a a brilliant cover by jasmine aurora for moonflower the publisher i've given the publisher the synopsis well i've told them basically what happens and what the key locations are in the coming fire the third one in the trilogy so that they can make the cover right now and so that it can sit alongside the other two on the on their web page on the amazon mm-hmm. page etc so that so that readers can see look there it is and it will be out on this date and so on um and and because the cover shows that that sibling connection don't yeah. they they and they tell the reader yeah this is a set of books and they're going to be the same heroes they're going to be the same concerns and they're going to build um but um but i do know i do know a lot about what's going to happen but i don't write it down mm. and i think that's because for 30 years i've worked with um playwrights and novelists and um and screenwriters helping them with story development so my brain is constantly thinking, well, if this happens now, then that can happen later. And then it can turn out that it wasn't what you thought it was that instead. And that's just yeah, that's how my brain works. I think the, oh, the, point you, sorry, the, the point you make, Greg, about uh, having to have the other books lined up and, and the covers displayed, as it were, on, the, on the, uh, the publisher's website really points out the fact that, that publishing is, in fact, an industry, as we all know. But... Um, for the readers out there who might fondly assume 
um, the, the people are, are you know, uh, it's more of a, a random sort of industry than might be supposed. It is actually very, uh, these days it's very, very organized and very, very well thought out. And um, it, Although, I, do you I not, take my hat off to anyone who manages to get published these days. Do you not find, Andrew, that it's incredibly slow moving for a lot of people? And I've, I've, I've focused so much of my effort in trying to make sure that the books come out quickly one after another to satisfy it. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah in the chat was has said how books were a lifeline yeah. during the lockdown. Yeah. And Laura, the escape from reality that thrillers give. Mm -hmm. And Because when, when you read a book that you like, you, you want the next one ASAP, don't you? Well, yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah, you find uh, it pressurized though. Having you know, you said you've got the three book deal, and you obviously knew Greg when you started writing that it's going to be a trilogy. Is it? Does it? Is the pressure on more than when you do a standalone? I'm speaking for myself, yes, because uh, <laughs> uh, I've been totally lackadaisical about how I write. I, I write when I want to write, and uh, if I don't want to write, I won't. Uh, now <laughs> I'm contractually <laughs> tied into uh, having to produce the goods. So yeah, I've turned into the wee guy on the conveyor belt and um, having to churn out the thousand words a day sort of thing. So, but it's a, it's a good discipline as well, um, mm. uh, and it kind of ties into what Greg says uh, that you know, if you have a market out there, if I can call readers a market, then you know they're looking for the next book and they're not going to wait forever. So yeah, it has to be done. So uh, another thing that came up at Fatal Shore in Shoreham that um, Ellie Griffiths and William Shaw have set up and organized was um, somebody asked about chat GPT and, you know, machines writing, yeah. writing novels. And, um, and I said, well, the thing is, there's probably a robot that's better at, I don't know, playing bridge or playing tennis than I am. But I still do those things because I like doing them. I like, I like writing as it happens. <laughs> That's a thing that I really love to do. So if on the, the other side of that coin, though, is there is a pressure from the future. I sometimes refer to it as like the debt that I've got to the future. The things that I've promised to do are my debt to the future. And I, I want I don't want that debt to be too broad and too long lasting. So it feels out, out of control. Yeah, future. I always call it future Karen. I always say, what is, what's future Karen going to think about that? <laughs> <laughs> is she going to be annoyed with, with, with past Karen or is she going to think, you know, that past Karen did her a favour? Well, past, past Greg that goes to the garage to get petrol and doesn't buy chocolate is always annoying future Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um. What research do you do for your books? Because obviously, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff around with yours, Greg, particularly you wrote in the future. Yeah. So obviously that's that hasn't been written. So that's obviously quite difficult to research. But how now, did you ah, sort of go now, about Sorry, it? I'm going to contradict you. So, <laughs> right. The future is, is not difficult to research because um, every responsible organization governments, councils, corporations, international organizations. I used to be an interpreter and worked at OECD and European Union and so on. All of these organizations are constantly planning for a future that they're predicting. And researching the future is about meshing together all of those ideas and from scientific journals and so on and making a coherent world out of all of those predictions, which are all grounded in reality. So when I started, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be really hard work. I might have to um, obfuscate. I might have to, like, steer clear of technology and advances in um, protein folding and whatever it might be, whatever the text might be. But in the end, it was really easy to find that information. And e even down to simple things. So the third, the third one in the trilogy, the there's been an AI generated viral collapse of international data and communications and IT services. And um, the um, the way in which that happens has been predicted by IT specialists and science scientists, and they and they'll tell you that stuff for free because it's all out there. So that that was my my process uh, from multiple journals and things. 
Yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around a utopian future where a government actually plans for the future. But <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, yeah, my, my research was very much um, because uh, it was very environmentally driven, my novel. Mm. I, I did a huge amount of research into the environment. Um, and also uh, dark matter is its ugly head as well, just just for the fun of it. Um, so yeah, a lot of cosmology and, and uh, all the rest of it, which is great. I, I love uh, research, to be honest. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite bits of any book. Um, usually it's locations and such like that. I'm researching for crime. But um, yeah, I'd really you, enjoyed the would research. You say, would you say, Andrew, like my wife Kate says, that the location is one of the most important characters? Uh, in my books, I think it is because uh, I, I often have the comment that the uh, the locality, the you know, Scotland, in, in my case, is like a character in the book anyway. So, um, yeah, very important for me. Uh, which which kind of begs the question: if I did go down a, a, a really hard science fiction route, uh, how I'd uh, how I'd cope with describing. Uh, an imagined world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That might be quite quite an interesting challenge. Could you have yeah, an imaginary definitely. Scotland? <laughs> yeah, well, I sometimes live in that. <laughs> <laughs> but you are right. It is hard to imagine a benign government, isn't it? Um, At the moment it is, yes. Because hmm. actually what I was going to ask you was how important is the setting for you when you're, I mean, yours, yours is obviously very important with your other crime books, Andrew, but have you, did you purposely set yours in Paris, you know, in the first book, um, Greg, was there a reason why Paris was, you know, what sort of led you to that setting? Because well, I knew it super well, because I was an interpreter and that was where I was based. That was where I lived. And um, it was where I came across, um, diplomats whispering in corners in a room in the basement in UNESCO or OECD and so on, who were clearly doing deals or sharing covert information and so on. And, um, you know, if you ask them what their job was, they'd be trade attaches and cultural advisors and so on, but they're clearly spies. And um, it, but it, but in, in order for it not to be a foolish game, this, spy business which it clearly is most of the time i'd go so far as to say 95 percent of the time um there has to be a significant enemy so then i because i had this idea for this very intuitive agent or officer i suppose we should call him that's a more a better title uh alex um i needed to imagine a treacherous enemy who, um, a little bit like in a video game, is not the biggest enemy. Because over the course of the trilogy, larger and greater threats must be discovered. Because it has to be a crescendo, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and, um, and I could imagine that because I knew those international organizations, those institutions in Paris, some of them I'd worked in. I knew where the Directorate General for External Security was, which is not far from the Père Lachaise Cemetery, incredibly, on the eastern edge of Paris. And I knew where the Internal Security Agency was based in Le valois Perry. And I'd actually been there um, working as an interpreter one day and had to sign all sorts of papers that I wouldn't tell anybody anything about what was spoken of which was an international conference on the fishing of carp, would you believe? You've told like us. The least, the least <laughs> sensitive thing you could possibly imagine. <laughs> You're a dead man walking. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Well, Knowledge of carp <laughs> has followed me through. I mean, and I did in the commercial sector, I did much more, much more um, exciting and dramatic and touchy things. I don't know, like oil fineries in Algeria, um, which you think would be much, anyway. Um, the, yeah, the point was, Karen, that I, I, I knew the, the world in which Alex would be navigating his way and trying to find the, the spider at the centre of the web. Yeah, interesting. And, and for you, Andrew, yeah. Scotland's your home. Is, is, that, is that why it's so sort of integral to your books? Uh, yeah, basically, I've lived up here for what I don't know, uh, thirty, thirty-five years. So, um, 
uh, still got my London accent originally, but um, yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the reason. I mean, it's quite interesting all this talk of uh, signing, you know, official secrets and all that. I've, I've had to do that numerous times uh, in my life, um, and you know, you you do some of these experiences you have do stay with you, and, and uh, none of none of mine have yet um, yet launched me into print. Although there's a couple of things I can think of. Um, I was once at the uh, uh, the UK ambassador's residence in Baghdad during the height of the uh, Iran Iraq War, and we were having G and T in the in the garden uh, as you do, and there's a huge sort of explosion very nearby, it, uh, sufficient for the ice to all rattle around. And I said, "What was that?" And he said, "Oh, don't worry, old chap. It's an Iranian missile. They have absolutely no idea where they're going to land." Uh, so, you know, things like that, you think, oh, my gosh, sure I could stick that in a book, but no one would probably believe it. And I also, uh, I was doing, a, I used to do a lot of live sound work as well as um, other uh, clandestine electronic stuff that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, you just did, I, you know that. Yeah, I, yeah, but I, I oh, alluded, honestly, I alluded to it. So I, never, I, never <laughs> so, I never mentioned just the actual the men in black. Just, right. I never mentioned the actual That's fish, right, so Laura I'm... says I should be worried right now. And <laughs> still, if they so, come for Andrew first, they can't be yeah, coming well, for you at the same time, can they? You'll, you'll never hear about it. But, um, yeah, the, the, the other interesting thing I had, uh, there's a band that used to tour with the Stranglers, and um, we were doing a private party in Bath, uh, and in the basement of this room was the regional HQ uh, in terms of civil unrest or uh, nuclear war or whatever, which basically consisted of a, an old wind-up telephone stuck on the wall. <laughs> and I think it was a relic from the Second World War. It was really interesting. Um, absolutely mad. I love, I love this sort of stuff. So, yeah, I don't there like to spend a, my time but there was a kind scouting of UNESCO. There was a kind of madness, wasn't there? I, oh, yeah, I, know, absolutely. I know somebody who in a tight, a funny little village whose wonderful name is Diddy Bones Knapp, <laughs> just around, like not far from where I live in southwest Sussex, who built mm. a hexagonal house with a bomb shelter in the basement with a submarine door at the back of the garage that was the ground floor of the house. And then and there was this concrete tunnel with very thick walls that led into the orchard behind the house with another horizontal submarine door so that you could creep out and perhaps pick the yeah. apples and go back down again. Yeah, and I was, was going to say, it was, need, it was the most ridiculous doors. idea. How long are you going to live in this sealed concrete <laughs> tube with tins of baked beans? And imagine and the atmosphere that that would... <laughs> Not very long with rising sea levels. You, you need more than submarine doors. You need a submarine. In fact, have you got tropical rain in Scotland like we yes, have in Sussex absolutely. just now? It's pissing down, I think it's safe to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we were talking about that when we came on, weren't we? That we just. We like, were indeed. We, we've had it here, so yeah. yeah. Where are you? Not Karen? Nice. I'm in Devon. Are you somewhere delightful? I love Devon. I am. Oh, where am I? Where am I close to? Well, I'm sort of about. I'm in mid Devon. So what, I'm like near Crediton, for example. Cred well, I'm near, yes. Well, I'm seven miles from Crediton. So. Oh, how oh, wonderful! Okay. Yes, I know yeah. Crediton. Nice, nice yeah. area. Yeah. Do so, you uh, know? Do you know the pub in Colford where there is a resident parrot? The new inn, yes. That's I do. the one. Yeah. And and, the, and I used to work there as a waitress many years ago. No. And, and the and the parrot is called Captain, and he swears. Oh yes. <laughs> and um, in Crediton, there is a wonderful community bookshop. Do you, have you? Do you ever go there? Um, I have been there, yes, yes, yeah. in my past life, I have, yeah. yes. Wonderful yeah. place. Yeah. Um, so we'll come back to um, your writing. And um, <laughs> Andrew, your previous books have been more police procedural, haven't they? More crime, like early gig we were talking about earlier was quite dark. And Indeed. and with you, Greg, your your writing background is theatre, and so how how have the changes to this? To, to Cli-Fi, how, how has that been? Has it been an enjoyable experience? Has it been a challenging experience? Oh, it's been enjoyable for me. I, 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 liked, uh, I like getting away from crime. Um, as I say, you know, the, uh, the first book I re wrote was uh, more of a sort of a, a fairy story uh, mm. with heavy inverted commas around it. Um, and I only wrote crime because I was told that's what people wanted. Uh, and it seems I'm very good at it, evidently. So um, I thought, well, I don't want to get typecast, which is a theatrical term, I believe. So uh, I'll, I'll try something completely different. Uh, now, now I'm tied into another three crime books. 
<laughs> so yeah, I'll be looking to do something different again after that. Uh, I think it's good. I think it's good to do um, different genres and, and explore new new ideas. I think it keeps the writing fresh and uh, all the rest of it. So I wouldn't want to do you know a, a never-ending series about the same uh, no. police team, whatever. Not not it's for me. Because some people do, don't they? Some people do oh, yeah. write. Absolutely. You know, they and stay it's, in their genre their whole career. Yeah, you know. Nothing wrong with that. I, I, I just don't think I can do it. Uh, Peter James's most recent book is a really excellent Peter James book. You know, when people have written that many books, you, mm. yeah, and it's uh, really, really good. And an interesting thing about it is that the um, there's a there there are two storylines with cliffhangers at the end of it, like a TV drama series. Mm. Like there's going to you know it's been an eight part series, and there's going to be another one next year. And the book really feels like that. Um, it's it's interesting that when you get to that sort of stratospheric level, there's a there are other pressures on how you write and how you structure mm. on there. Um, the the other thing was, of course, that because um, because of all the lockdowns and the slow process of getting a book deal and then taking it through all the editorial process and so on, by the time the Coming Darkness was about to come out, which was uh, twelve months ago, last November. Um, I'd written the three cozy crime novels to the satisfaction of my agent so that we could sell them to Hodder and Stoughton as a, as a set of four. And then in the period since all of that happened, um, I've been back and forth between the two series sort of indiscriminately oh. at the whim of the two different publishing houses sending me um, major edits, line edits, copy edits, proofreading, and so on. And I think that the my theatre background, in which, in I don't know, one week I might be writing jolly songs for a musical, and the following week I might be writing a historical drama about smugglers, mm. and the techniques of writing remain consistent, but the subject matter differs. Mm. So I think that set me up quite well. Can I just say to Sarah, who's asked, do I have a favourite author? Is Has she read Kate Moss? Because she really should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> favourite authors, yes. Hello, Sarah. Um, goodness me. I don't know. that My, my favourite author changes with the seasons, really. Um, I read Percival Everett very recently, uh, The Trees, which is uh, extremely dark. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, dark novel, and I, I, I love that. So uh, yeah, I guess he's one of my favourite authors at the moment. Can I follow up another step on this? Because the procedural thing is something that I already, I've, I've always um, avoided. Uh, e even though I, I, I like reading them, and I really respect the, um, the understanding and technique of the actual professionals who do the, do the detection. Um, I, I, at Harrogate this summer, I went to one of the sessions that was led by Chris Merritt and um, Graham Bartlett. So Graham's obviously an expert in police procedure from his mm -hmm. lifetime of professional background. Mm -hmm. And Chris Merritt is an expert in um, the psychology of trauma was what the event was about. And all the time I was thinking, this is fantastically valuable, but I'm not going to write that. That's not going to be my preoccupation creatively. Isn't that interesting? There's no reason why it shouldn't, and it was very inspiring, mm -hmm. but I didn't think that would be for me. I mean, no, things may I, change. I, I'm kind of with you on that one, Greg, because um, although two of my books were, were police procedural, um, and, I, and I tried to remain as true as I could, to how a police force, a small police force, would operate, uh, as I could imagine, and, and using sort of best guessing, um, I really can't be bothered with going <laughs> into the minutiae of how many buttons a police sergeant might have on his uniform, and uh, which you know, some readers out there, bless them, uh, will pick you up, uh, uh, and you know, a Bonneville three hundred and fifty motorbike. There was never such a thing, etc. Et <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's all a bit anally retentive for me. Uh, I prefer to let the story carry itself and uh, not worry too much about the uh, minutiae of it. I mean, it's a work of fiction at the end of the day. So uh, perhaps I have to set mine in an, an alternative Scottish 
crime universe or something. <laughs> well, Kate, of course, sets her novels principally in history. She's currently mm -hmm. writing the Joubert family chronicles set in the Huguenot era. So that's the um, 16th, 17th century persecutions of the French Protestant people. Um, who end up in South Africa as very important wine growers. And if you watched the Rugby Union World Cup final last night, you'd I have did. seen the Dutois and the Malzerbe and the Joubert on the pitch playing, and they're the descendants of those Protestants. Mm. Um, so what Kate does is her history is always completely unimpeachable, but she finds a way of writing personal stories um, of invented fictional characters who fit into the gaps in that panoramic panoramic drama mm. which is yeah. um which i think people um i think people really appreciate the um the, the strength of her his, her authentic historical knowledge yeah uh, putting flesh on the bones of the past really yeah, I think it's, I think people will, you know, I've spoken to other authors and, that, you know, particularly with historical authors that, that people are very hot on picking up on things if you get them incorrect, even if it is a work of fiction, they still want it, you know, to be as it should be. So there is that sort of poetic license around, particularly um, where there's not history written in that, where you can go a bit more, you know, off, off on a tangent so, and decide what you want to do. So my, my fu the future fiction, obviously, The Coming Darkness, is a tangent because it's 15 years in the future. And then the opposite end of that is the um, my cosy crime novels, Murder at Church Lodge and Murder at Bunting Manor comes out next month, November. They are set in southwest Sussex villages when I was in 1972, when I was 11. And if anybody says it wasn't like that, I will simply say what it was. I was there. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. I'll tell Kate you said that. <laughs> um, when you're writing peril and drama, how how do you make it terrifying but also plausible? Because you know, so, because great question. You know, that's you know. It's important. Well, hmm. when I write, uh, I, I I write very much with the the actual film running in my head. So um, if it doesn't if it doesn't look right inside my head, then uh, I know I've got it wrong. So yeah, that's very much. I, I'm a very visual writer. I think if mm. there is such a thing, um, I think so. I think I'm, I'm, as a film script. I think I'm a visual reader. So I think for mm. me, I have to be able to imagine it when I'm reading it. Well, I'd fall flat on my face if I tried being cerebral. So, um, yeah, visual is, <laughs> is, is my way. Um, so I, I don't know if this is an annoying sort of writerish thing to say, but it's it, it's this. Um, it's from point of view. It's It feels perilous because of the narrowness of point of view. The reader perceives the danger before the character. Do you see? Yeah. And that means that, so the simple example would be if there has been a breakout chapter that has revealed that the, the bad people are in the woods, and then it goes back to principal character me walking up the lane into the woods, that's the peril. And it's, it, it, it comes from the, the gap in understanding. Um, so the, it's the reader having more knowledge than the character and therefore the character is going to be shocked surprised in physical danger etc i think so much of writing is about different people within the story knowing different things creating this suspenseful mm -hmm. tension and then the reader having more knowledge than the disparate characters within within the book and 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 using those gaps in knowledge and the tension, because in the end, those gaps must close, mustn't they? Because that's what the end of the book is. Yeah. It's everybody knowing everything. And that's that's where suspense comes from, suspense of all kinds, including in romance, right? There's a That's a different sort of suspense. Or in it erotic is. fiction, that's another sort of suspense, which is eventually resolved by bringing those disparate things together.
Well, we're back to clarify, I see. But um, yeah, no, I, I agree with uh, I agree with you there, Greg. Uh, there is. You're saying the T is silent, is what you're saying, isn't it? <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but um, apart from uh, that, the scene, the scenery, the the geographical location can also, uh, as we've already described, be be a character. Oh. And um, certainly, in, in some of my books, I've used. Uh, the remoteness of place, the inability to receive phone signals, yeah. uh, to be out on your own, uh, very much as a character and as a device in itself. Um, and in this latest book that I've just finished writing, which I think is going to be called The Girl in the Loch, um, I'm not sure, um, it's out of my hands to a large degree, um, the loch as such also plays quite a, quite a a part in in the story it's um it's quite oppressive uh and restricted and there's often a lot of mist on it which uh, uh probably relates to my thinking processes about the plot but uh, very very much the, the the whole geographical locale mm -hmm. is a character and influences how people behave and how the story progresses um yes. sarah just asked if um we've ever had to act out a scene from our books and i do know writers that that do that there's a very famous film i think a 1960s movie about a writer who acts out um murders and then gets some one of the people that he sort of pretends to murder dies and of course he is the prime suspect because he practiced murdering the person in order to <laughs> write his book it's I'm just trying. It, I, I can't. Was it Jack Lemon? It was an actor like that. Anyway, mm. um, the the answer for me is I don't do that because, um, like Andrew was saying earlier about, about it being a f like watching a film, a filmic experience. Um, I I write like I'm listening to an audio book, so I I love words and I love audio books and I'm when I'm editing. What I'm doing is I'm editing to make the rhythm of it a better audio book, which yeah. I, I suppose that's a sort of acting. Yes, I, I, I'm personally disappointed that I can't uh, imagine you and Kate acting out a, a, a death scene on the on the floor behind you there, but uh, <laughs> or, or maybe <laughs> on board a ship on the way through well, the South Atlantic to Cape Town. Oh, yeah, Jack Lemon, good. How to Murder Your Wife. I was going to say that's just popped up. Yes, <laughs> Jack Lemon, How to Murder Your Wife. Oh my God, these people, they know everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't, there's nothing that gets back. Also, they've got Google at the other end. We can't ah, just do uh, that. True, yeah. I, I thought, my God, how did they know that? But, uh, yeah, the only scene I've ever acted out actually comes from my uh, uh, my uh, hundred favorite Kaylee dances, uh, where I was running out of dances, so I invented one and we had to practice it in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, everything else happens entirely in my head because uh, I'd be arrested otherwise. Um, characters. So in your books, again, you've got you've got the characters um, in your thrillers. You've got your your Alex, who's um, how did you, was he sort of derived from people that you knew? And the same with you, Andrew, you know, are your characters, do they sort of come from people that you know, but not exactly and, and bits of, uh, you know, is it sort of made up? Is it like a jigsaw? Uh, well, uh, for me, uh, they're all entirely made up. Um, I, I can't imagine I'm, I'm basing my characters on anyone that I can think of or remember, but uh, saying that uh, life experience will uh, influence how you write yeah. and uh, and what you can write about. So yeah, I guess uh, all of us have got to be guilty of um, using what's out there uh, in pursuance of our own uh, artistic endeavors, which sounds very grand, but um, yeah, uh, amalgams of people I know, I guess, probably would be the honest answer. Um, so yes, I I sent um, I sent the Coming Darkness to a publisher that I knew I know quite well, who said um, it was it was a mixed response. <laughs> the first part <laughs> of it was um, <laughs> yes, a a Alex is excellent. I really wanted to be him, <laughs> <laughs> but the book as a whole, I didn't understand it. Which I think is more of a reflection on him than on me, because lots of people have understood it very clearly. So, um, 
the um, there's got to be a there's got to be a, in an adventure story there's got to be a, an aspirational thing, hasn't there? Mm. You've because the hero of an adventure story at some point is going to face overwhelming odds, and yet they will triumph. And like you were saying earlier, Karen, about the peril, it must be plausible, right? Yeah. When yeah. they triumph, it must be plausible. Um, um, Andrew, can you say something? Because I'm being dazzled by the light through my blind. The sun has just yes, I'll be back in a second. Uh, well, I could discuss Jess, who's kind of the lead uh, character yeah. in my Song of Winter. Uh, Jess has uh, a past that she's managed to keep hidden from her husband, uh, essentially special forces. Uh, and her background was that she was brought up on a um, one of these commu communes uh, on the west coast of Scotland. Um, I, I don't know if they exist for real, but uh, that's that's what I invented for her. Uh, and this lot were called the Spartans because they they adhered to a very strict uh, upbringing, whereupon you either make it or you don't, sort of thing. So, um, uh, true survivors, really. So that that's her background, which equips her rather well for um, a world that newly turned to ice. Um, so yeah, that, that, that kind of, uh, that's kind of my character's background. So yeah, totally imagined. Uh, I couldn't find anything about these, um, survivalists on the internet to, uh, to try and find out about them. Uh, they tend to keep very quiet, uh, in case people raid their tins of beans, uh, <laughs> and such like, uh, you can come across the shops where, where you can buy all sorts of useful equipment, including crossbows. Um, or of course, if it's, uh, United States. Uh, no end of uh, automatic weapons and all the rest of it. But uh, over here, um, the only thing they're allowed to sell really are crossbows. Uh, and even those can be a bit dangerous, as the guy who um, tried to uh, remove the Queen uh, about a year ago, wasn't it, uh, uh, displays. Or very famously in Lionel Shriver's book, we have to talk about Kevin, or we need to talk about Kevin, where yeah. it is a multi-murder with a crossbow that's at the center of the action but on on that character thing so i i had an idea of the sort of person that alex needs to be because he is so he's relatively senior at 32 years old and as an officer of the um french secret service he's obviously going to be um athletic and um physically capable and intelligent and he has this intuition and then of course other things creep in and of course you, you don't sort of think about it or I didn't while I was writing it by but Kate and I are, have been carers for three of our parents both of Kate's parents have now have since died and my mum who's 92 is still in our house and very sadly I couldn't go to Brighton yesterday for Donna's event because my uh, she was unwell and confined to a wheelchair and so on. Anyway, here's the thing. Alex's mum is, I think she's 58 or 59 years old. And um, one of the interviews I did, somebody asked how, why it was that I made a Secret Services agent a carer. And he, he's not a carer, but he is attentive to his mum. <laughs> who also lives in Paris and is a historian by profession. And then, of course, um, it, it, she's woven into the plot in the sense that when when Alex wants to refuse orders that he does not consider justified, pressure is exerted on him by his superiors through his mum, who is unwell in 2037 from a novel virus, and in order to get her preferential medical treatment, he says, OK, I'll do it. So it's it's woven completely into mm. the plot. But of course, it's also it's an element of my life. Yeah. Which seeps in. And that's right, isn't it, Andrew? Your own life, your own experiences, they seep in and they colour uh, or they fill in the colours in the outlines of the characters, maybe. Indeed, yes. Um Although not always, some pe some people have a very good imagination. Um, <laughs> uh, some of us have, have been exposed to things that we'd rather not be exposed to. Um, but yeah, it it all influences and uh, adds to the end product, I guess. So I'm just looking at the time, and we're nearly sort of coming up to the end. Surprisingly, oh it's goodness. gone really quickly. Um, 
and we took we touched on at the beginning so that this your the books that we're talking about today the song of winter and the coming darkness are um sort of climate fiction but both of you are moving i've got what's next so um you you touched on yours um andrew but do you want to tell us a little bit more about when they're coming out what they're what they're yeah, about yeah. and then also greg your cozy crime i'm interested to hear about those yeah, happy to, to do so. Um, I, as I say, I have a three-book deal with Storm publication. The first book will come out January the 18th, I think, uh, and it's called, I think, The Girl in the Lock. And for this... It's a great title. The Girl in the Lock is a great title. Stick with yeah, that. Stick with that. <laughs> I, I will stick with that. Um, and basically, I'm using the, uh, the idea of a, a private investigator uh, and his cohorts... Uh, to do all the uh, to do all the legwork, uh, a couple of reasons for this. One, I don't have to worry too much about the police procedural side of things, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can work seriously off grid uh, and, and off the page. Uh, it also allows me to move geographically. Uh, so uh, my my main character is in Belgium for a bit, for example. So you know, it gives, it gives much greater scope in how I can develop the story, mm -hmm. um, and. In terms of what the story is about, it's basically a uh, Glasgow gangster whose young daughter goes missing, three-year-old daughter goes missing, and he's called in the private investigator after a year uh, of searching because no one's been able to find out what happened to her. And it's basically quite a convoluted story uh, following that search. Uh, the other two books, uh, I'm halfway, over halfway through the next one, which involves uh, a bunch of unrelated murders or seemingly unrelated murders in Glasgow uh, laid out on the points of a pentagram. And the third book, because I've had to praise these <laughs> where they're going, uh, is basically a sort of thwarted love affair on the Western Isles. So yeah, that's, that's where I am with those. Amazing, they sound great. You'll have to come on and talk to us about them when they're out. Love to. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I said at the beginning didn't i so the coming darkness the coming storm the coming fire um then because of lockdown and so on and um, i i wrote these cozy crime novels and and hodder bought four of them and we're publishing them all in july november march july which is really cool and exactly what i wanted for them to appear as quickly as possible so murder at church lodge came out in july uh, murder at bunting manor November, the next March will be Murder at the Theatre. And the fourth one, because my hero, Maisie Cooper, is um, in Murder at Church Lodge, the first one, she's drawn back from where she lives abroad to the UK because of a drama that revolves around her brother, who she loves very much. Um, the fourth one is Murder at Notre Dame, because she is back there in Paris. It's Somebody said to me the other day, is it an origin story for the coming darkness? It's not an origin <laughs> story. I love that. I wish I had done Good that idea. Well. <laughs> but but then I had a I had a gap in my schedule um in sort of April April, May, and I had this really lovely idea with a quite an intricate plot for another cozy crime mystery set in the present day. So I'm splitting a difference between Murder at Church Lodge in 1972 and The Coming Darkness in 2037. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, so I've written that first novel. And I've, I've been through two drafts with my agent. And that novel that we haven't sold yet, the hero of that novel is an elderly theatre director who has never retired, but whose telephone no longer rings. Yeah. And he gets drawn into solving a capital crime. So that will be fun. And I think maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll write at least one more in that series before we try and sell it to somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I am. Excellent. No, well, it's very stuff. busy by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've got another panel at five o'clock and I'm just seeing quickly whether I can remember what it is. I think it's crime in isolated places. I'm hoping that Sam is going to do a little type or Sam or Kaz will do a little typing thing and say 
Um, and then we've got um, one at seven o'clock, um, which is, I know it's Stuart Turton, um, and I think it's Sarah Moore House, my head, House. It, it, sorry if I've got your name wrong, Sarah. <laughs> It is indeed, she said. Phew, phew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, both. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Andrew, to find out about your book. A great um, pleasure to meet you, Andrew. But you were incredibly you, fluent. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Ka Karen, you guys are fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. and thank you for thank you for supporting us and coming on this afternoon. And thanks for and everyone coming to see us. Both of you. Bye, Bye now. Thank you. Cheers. Bye -bye. Nice meeting you. Bye.